Committee on Finance is hereby called to order. The time is 10.04 on Thursday, May 19th, 2022. Pursuant to applicable law, my determination that attendance by remote means is necessary because an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent due to the declared public health disaster caused by COVID-19. This meeting is conducted by video conference. For questions during the meeting, aldermen should use the raise your hand function and members of the committee shall be given preference. If you wish to make a point of order, point of information, or point of clarification while one of your colleagues is speaking, I ask that you please use the raise your hand function and unmute your microphone. We will now have a roll call to establish quorum. Please unmute your mic when uh, get ready to call your name and note that your yes or present response will be deemed to be a yes vote when the quorum roll call is used as a reference vote for later items. All right. Uh, Chairman Wagusback is present. Vice Chair Hairston. Present. Alderman Hopkins. Present. Alderwoman Dowell. Here. Alderwoman King. Present. Alderman Sawyer. Here. Alderman Mitchell. Alderwoman Harris. Alderman Beal, not present. Alderwoman Sadowski Garza. Alderwoman Lee. Alderman Cardenas. Alderman Quinn. Here. Alderman Burke. Alderman Lopez. Alderman Moore. Alderman Moore is present. Alderman Curtis. Alderman Curtis present. Alderman O'Shea. Alderman Brookins. Here. Alderman Tabaris. Alderman Scott. Alderman Burnett. Alderman Burnett present. Alderman Irvin. Alderman Irvin is present. Alderman Talia Farrow. Present. Present. Alderman Raboyris. Present. Alderman Austin. Present. Yeah. Alderman Viegas. And Alderwoman Mitz. Alderman Mitz is present. Thank you. Alderman Spazato. Next Spazato is here. Alderman Napolitano. Alderman Riley. Alderman Smith. Present. Alderman Tunney. Present. Alderman Osterman. Alderman Silverstein. Let's see, we have um, several other aldermen in attendance. Uh, Alderman Rosana Rodriguez, Alderman Felix Cardona. Alderman O'Shea is present, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a quorum. I just want to make sure we pick up anybody else that came in. All right, anyone comes in, we'll mark them as present here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a quorum. Uh, before we go to two public speakers today, I just wanna cover one of the agenda items. Uh, as you know, we had uh, on the agenda, Mark, that we would have a hearing on the speed cameras. Uh, that was item number 16. Um, Alderman Beal filed a rule 41 five days ago. It was properly noticed. And I properly put it on the agenda for the committee on finance uh, to have a hearing on it. 
He has now asked me to hold this item uh, because of a personal issue. Um, I will hold it today and it will be heard at the next Committee on Finance meeting next month. Uh, but another note um, that we, a couple of things that we need to take care of. Um, I didn't receive the letter personally until someone dropped it off in my office this morning. Um, I was not emailed the letter, which uh, we since have forwarded on to everyone via Mario Holloman's in my office. Um, and just for AIS and uh, you know, IG, the uh, intergovernmental office, we need to take a look at how we're sending emails out from aldermen to the aldermanic list. Um, we need to make sure that when aldermen are sending out notices such as this to ask for something to be held uh, at the last minute, um, that we're all on the, the same page and getting that same list. So I'll, I'll work with um, mayor's office and AIS to make sure that everybody is on the list appropriately, both for chiefs of staff of the particular committees, but chiefs of staff of all these offices. Um, so we will, for the people that were the public speakers that I believe are here to speak about the speed enforcement issue, you can still speak, but um, it should be noted that Alderman Beal uh, asked for this item to be removed from the agenda today um, at his own um, asking. So um, let me go back to Alderman Osterman. Just to add me to the roll for purposes of chairman. Thank you. Alderman Silverstein. Could you please add me as president? Yes. And Alderman Riley, the same. Please add me to chairman. Thank you. Let me just check the attendees list here and make sure we're getting everyone in. Okay. So I've added uh, the three of you. Thank you. And um, going back to public speakers, let me just make sure we have them on the line here. Uh, I had two public speakers kind of come in the last minute there. Uh, first one, Kamal, do I have a Don Brosbono on the line? Mr. Brosbono? If, if the person on phone can, can tell us their name. Yes. Um, is this Mr. Brosbono or Mr. Wallace? You are unmuted. Go ahead and speak if you can. All right, Kamal, if we have the second person, why don't we go to them and then we can come back to that person. I'm sorry, Chairman, what were the names again? Sorry. Uh, either Brasfono or Wallace. I those don't are... see those names here. If, if okay. the person is here under some different name, can you please raise your hand in Zoom? And on the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. I, I don't see any hands raised, uh, Chairman. All right. Um, they might have canceled after Alderman. I think a couple of people were here to speak about the speed cameras and may have just canceled themselves out there. So. Uh, we will try for it next month when um, we put it back on the agenda. Thank you, Kamal. So, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to item number one on the agenda. Uh, this is the approval of the Rule 45 report from the March meeting. Does anyone have any questions or changes on this item? Uh, then Alderman, Alderwoman Austin makes a motion to approve the report by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. <clears throat> All right, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to item number two under the Department of Housing. This is a recommendation for a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to issue multifamily low income housing bonds for the purchase and development of 3737 West Portland Street, then Quantro Square to LP, and Quantro Square to GP and Latin United Community Housing Association, Lucha, in the 26th Ward. We're joined by Joe Lewis from the Department of Housing for testimony on this matter. And 
we're also, as it's stated in the uh, agenda item, this is for an amount up to $19,500,000. Joe, are you ready? Um, my name is Esther Sorrell. I'm assistant commissioner with the Department of Housing. I'm standing in for Joe Lewis, who is unavailable. unavailable. Thank you, Deputy Sorrell. My apologies. Um, I do have a screen to share, if possible. Mr. Chairman, um, Alderman Villegas, could you add me to the quorum, please? Yes, sir. Gotcha. If tech support could allow me to share my screen, I do have a PowerPoint deck. Other than that, so you should be okay now, please. Yep. Kamal, Kamal will share it there for you. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Chairman Waxback and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Esther Sorrell, Assistant Commissioner from the Department of Housing. Before you today is a bond inducement ordinance for the Enquintral Square Phase One transaction that requests authorization to issue up to $19.5 million in tax exempt housing bonds and notes. At the terminus of the 606 trail, the proposed Enquintral Square Phase One development will be located in the 26th Ward, represented by Alderman. Roberto Maldonado at the nexus of the Logan Square, Avondale and Hermosa communities. The project site was formerly an industrial land use. While the 606 trail was under development, the site was acquired by the Trust for Public Land in 2014 and sold to the city of Chicago. The development site is currently owned by the city and the proposal to redevelop the site as in Quintral Square was received in DOH's 2019 tax credit funding round. In Quintral Square will consist of the new construction of two elevator buildings that will house a total of 89 affordable rental one to three bedroom units, 56 adjacent surface parking spaces, bike storage, tenant community space, and exterior terrace and tenant lounge spaces. The building at approximately 3737 West Cortland Street is the larger of the two and the subject of the bond inducement. This building will contain 57 total affordable units ranging in size from one bedroom Two be uh, 13 one bedroom, 35 two bedroom, and three and nine three bedroom units. Six units will be for CHA residents, and the remainder will be restricted to households earning no more than 60% of Chicago area median income. The other building will be located at approximately 3745 West Cortland Street and will contain 32 affordable units ranging in size from six one bedroom units, 12 two bedroom units, and 14 three bedroom units. 13 units will be restricted for CHA residents and the remainder will be restricted to households earning no more than 60% of Chicago area median income. Total development costs for 3737 West Cortland Street are approximately $35,114,000. And in addition to funds derived from the city bond issuance, the transaction will also be funded with a city multifamily loan, TIF assistance, grant funds from ComEd, and equity from tax credits. Final approval of city sourced financial assistance for the overall in Quintral Square project phase one project will be the subject of a future city council, a future city council action tentatively planned for early Q3 2022. 
The developer is a joint venture of Latin United Community Housing Association, also known as Lucha, a nonprofit housing developer and social services organization established in 1982 and affiliates of Evergreen Real Estate Services. Lucha's mission is to advance housing as a human right by empowering Chicago communities through advocacy and affordable housing development with a focus on support, supporting Chicago's Latinx and Spanish speaking populations. Past projects completed by Lucha with city funding include Tierra Linda Apartments in 2018, Born Point Bay Apartments in 2013, Madre Unidas Apartments in 2006, and Humboldt Park Residence in 1996. Evergreen was founded in 1999, and its management portfolio includes more than 50 properties in 10 states with over 10,000 units. Past projects completed by Evergreen or its principals with city and funding include Independence Library and Apartments, Northtown Library and Apartments, Martha Washington Apartments, and Sangamon Terrace Apartments. Alderman Maldonado is supportive of the Encuentro Square Phase One project. If there are any questions, we can entertain them at this time. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner Sorrell. Uh, before I go on to questions, I want to recognize for as present for purposes of quorum, Alderman Burke and Alderwoman Tabaris. I'm sorry, Chairman, our machine wasn't working properly. That's okay, sir. Um, and also, Alderman Coleman. Alderman Brookins, I had you. Let's see. Um, okay. All right. Do we have any questions for Commissioner Sorrell? Again, this is a, an item in the 26th Ward. Um, Alderman Maldonado is not present, but I know that he wanted to move this forward. Uh, do we have any other questions? All right, then uh, I have a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum by Alderman Villegas. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, Commissioner Sorrell. Thank you, Chair. Alderman Burke, I'm gonna, I just, uh, I didn't know if you were trying to speak there, but I muted you. Did you have a question? You're muted now. All right, um, Alderman Burke, I didn't know if you were trying to speak. So uh, if you had a question, just you can unmute yourself there. But I think we were okay. All right, I'll move on uh, to item number three. Um, item number three is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute a redevelopment agreement with Build Incorporated Broader Urban Involvement in Leadership Development and Build Support Corporation, QALICB, developers to provide tax increment financing for eligible costs of renovation and facility additions of the Youth Community Center with sports and fitness facilities located at 5100 and 5112 West Harrison Street in the 29th Ward. We are joined by Terrence Johnson from the Department of Planning and Development for testimony on this matter. Uh, Terrence, are you ready? I am. Let me share my screen here. Yes, Kamal will set you up there. Okay. Uh, one second, uh, Terrence. Uh, Alderman Taliaferro. Uh, chairman, I can speak after Terrence speaks. Okay, thank you. I was going to have thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. 
whenever you're ready, Terrence. Okay, can everyone see the screen there? Yes, we're all good, ready when you are. Great. All right. Good morning, Chairman Wegspeck and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Terrence Johnson, Assistant Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of a redevelopment agreement between the city and Build Incorporated for the purpose of providing a TIF grant that will be used to help fund improvements and in addition to the Build Community Center and offices. The project is located at 5100 West Harrison Street in the Austin community area, the 29th Ward, and the Harrison Central TIF District. This map shows an aerial view of the site that is approximately 60,000 square feet. It is located near the intersection of Harrison and Kedzie, close to the Eisenhower Expressway. BUILD is a nationally respected nonprofit gang intervention, violence prevention, and youth development organization. Created in 1969 and based on the west side of Chicago and has helped thousands of at-risk youth escape gangs and violence to become positive leaders of their communities. Build partners with a number of local schools and runs 16 programs in various spe specialties such as violence prevention, education, and youth enrichment. And youth enrichment. Build serves more than 5,000 youth and families annually. The total project cost for build is approximately 12, 21 million. They're proposing to redevelop the existing 10,000 square foot community center building and construct an approximately 39,000 square foot addition. The existing and newly constructed buildings will house a community center, which will serve youth in the surrounding area. The center will contain activity rooms, a gym, running tracks, fitness center, lounge, game room, and other amenities. If approved, the redevelopment agreement will authorize up to 2.5 million in TIF assistance or 11.9% of the total project cost. In addition to TIF, the project will leverage state and private grants, donations, and new market tax credits. The TIF grant will be provided into installments of 1.25 million each. The first payment will be made at the issuance of the certificate of completion with the second payment made at the one year anniversary of the certificate of completion. Here's a, here's a rendering of what the completed building will look like. The L-shaped building to, to the west there is uh, the existing structure and the new construction is uh, the three-story building in the middle. Here's another rendering as well. Alma Natalia Farrell is supportive of the project and has provided a letter of support. I thank you for your consideration of this request and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm also joined by Kristen Malik, Chief Development Officer, and Bradley Johnson, Director of External Affairs of, of Build Incorporation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right, before I go to Alma Natalia Farrell, are there any questions for Mr. Johnson or for the Build team? Um, I just want to say before I go to Alderman Taliaferro that I have uh, worked with some of the members of the board from BUILD for many years and uh, watched as this project has uh, come to fruition. And I think it's a fantastic uh, project, fantastic effort they're making in uh, Alderman Taliaferro's ward, but I know it addresses uh, Alderman Scott's ward and several others as well. And it's good to see BUILD being able to, to move forward in this manner to create such a facility. So I, I wanna thank Mr. Johnson and his team for all of their work at DPD as well, because I know this has been a long time coming, but uh, definitely worth it. And it'll, it'll be a great enhancement to the West side there. Um, with that, I'll hand it off to Alderman. Oh, Alderman Raboy was first, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna, um, uh, there's a key word there, build. And uh, as you mentioned, I, <laughs> I just wanted to say congratulations to everyone that's uh, uh, presenting this and including uh, Chairman Talaferro. Uh, I, I, and I wanted to make it clear that I am a product of BUILD. I, I, I was when I was a kid, so, so thank you for that. 
That is all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Mm -hmm. And I'll hand it over to Alderman Taliaferro. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And I, um, I just want to concur with your statements as well as my colleague, um, uh, Alderman Reborius. Uh, and I want to thank Bill, Adam Alonzo, uh, Bradley Johnson, and DPD for bringing this project. Um, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, visit um, a community center, sports center, and um, Alderman Bill's board. And I just thought it would be a great idea uh, for, for that type of project to be placed throughout the city in some of the neighborhoods that need them to mow the most. And and I want to thank Bill for bringing this project because you know, this can have a significant impact on uh, just building families and building um, uh, bridges to families from organization to families whereby we can make a difference in the communities and, and having an impact on the lives of young men and young women and also um, having an impact, a positive impact um, on helping to raise families. Um, every community should have a, a community center um, where these families can go to for resources, for, for training, for activities, um, because it keeps them off the street. And um, I just know that this will have a great impact on the West Side in the 37th, the 24th, the 28th, and the 29th Ward. Um, so I'm excited about it. And I look forward um, to the, um, this project, and um, it has my complete support. Uh, thank you so much, Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Urban, did you want to say anything? I know this is, uh, again, this is a great project. Uh, I think whether it's a skating rink, a community center like this, all the things that you guys are working on out there, and I know they take a long time. I uh, just talking to Bill, trying with talking to Adam, Alon uh, Mr. Alonzo, and trying to get this moving forward takes time, but I think the efforts uh, to create space for families and children uh, has been a great undertaking by all the wards there that were mentioned. So um, I have a motion then from Alderman Urban to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. All right, item number four is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of a new soccer track, softball, and lacrosse fields at Northside College Preparatory High School, located at 5501 North Kesey Avenue in the 40th Ward. We're joined by Ivan Hansen from the Chicago Public Schools for testimony on this matter. Good morning, Chairman Wagaspak and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I'm the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I am joined today by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. Uh, Jamel, can you pull up the slides, please? What is your, this yes, is your uh, Chairman, I need permission to share my screen. Yeah, this, is, this is good repetition. All right, Kamala, get that for you. Well, that should work for you now. You have co-host capability. There we go. Thank you. All right. I, where are we starting? Uh, we're starting on uh, Northside uh, College Prep. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that would provide Chicago Public Schools with up to $4.5 million in TIF assistance for two projects at Northside Prep High School. One is the construction of a turf field, and two would be upgrading the building automation system. Here's a map showing the general location of the school within the city 
The school is located at 5501 North Kedzie Avenue in the North Park community area and the 40th Ward. It is located within the Lawrence Kedzie TIF District. The school is bounded by Foster Avenue to the south, Virginia Avenue to the east, Bryn Mawr Avenue to the north, and Sawyer Avenue to the west. Next slide. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located on Kedzie Avenue and the pictures of the existing turf field and building automation system. Northside Prep is a neighborhood high school serving 1,042 students in the 9th through 12th grade. The turf field project includes construction of a new turf soccer field surrounded by a running track, artificial turf softball field, and a lacrosse field. The building automation system project includes upgrading and repairing and recertifying the system, which controls the environmental and mechanical systems in the building. Next slide. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement would authorize up to $4.5 million in TIF assistance which would finance the entirety of the project. Next slide is a concept plan illustrating what the new turf field may look like. Completion of the project is scheduled for the third quarter of 2023. I thank you for consideration of this request and I'm available to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, do we have any questions for Ivan on this particular item? All right, no questions. Then Alderman Reboiris makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. And Ivan, uh, we have you for item number five, which is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of a turf field replacement at Peter A. Reinberg Elementary School located at 3425 North Major Avenue in the 36th Ward. Ivan Hansen will provide testimony on this item as well. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen, and I'm the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined today by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that provides Chicago Public Schools with up to $400,000 in TIF assistance to retrofit the existing turf field at Rheinberg Elementary School. Here's a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 3425 North Major Avenue in a Portage Park community area and the 36th Ward. It is located within the Belmont Central TIF District. The school is bounded by Roscoe Street to the south, Central Avenue to the east, Newport Avenue to the north, and Menard Avenue to the west. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located on Point Street. Rheinberg is a neighborhood elementary school serving 739 students in the pre-K through eighth grade. The turf field includes replacement of the existing turf with a new surface and an organic fill. Next slide. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement would authorize up to $400,000 in TIF assistance, which would finance the entirety of the project. The completion of this project is scheduled for the third quarter of 2023. I thank you for consideration of this request, and I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. All right. Do we have any questions? Alderman Vegas, did you want to comment? All right, then uh, Alderman Silverstein makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Our next item is in the 33rd Ward. This is item number six, a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of a new soccer field and asphalt parking lot at Theodore Roosevelt High School, located at 3436 West Wilson Avenue in the 33rd Ward. We're joined by Ivan Hansen again for testimony on this item. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I am the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Planning and Development. 
I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that would provide Chicago public schools with up to $5.8 million in TIF assistance for the construction of a turf field at Roosevelt High School. Here is a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 3436 West Wilson Avenue in the Albany Park community area in the 33rd Ward. It is located within the Lawrence Kedzie TIF District. The school is bounded by Sunnyside Avenue to the south, Kimball Avenue to the east, Leland Avenue to the north, and St. Louis Avenue to the west. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located on Wilson Avenue and the pictures of the existing turf field. Roosevelt is a neighborhood high school serving just over 1,000 students in the 9th through 12th grade. Their turf field project includes construction of a new artificial turf soccer field in an asphalt parking lot. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement would authorize up to $5.8 million in TIF assistance, which will finance the entirety of the project. The next slide is a photo illustrating the new, what the new turf field may look like. Completion of the project is scheduled for the third quarter of 2023. And I thank you for consideration of this request and I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, before I go to questions, Alderman Brookins. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. So I, I guess my question, I have no question on this specific project, but just want to make sure or, or get some assurances or uh, um, some information on upgrades to schools that have no tips. Uh, sure, I can I can uh, briefly answer that is that we are in the process of our uh, FY uh, 23 capital plan. Um, we've had some public engagement on that already. We will be having some additional public engagement in the first two weeks of June. Um, and we will be looking to take that to our Ju June board at the end of uh, at the end of the month. Um, but we are happy to talk offline if you have any any other questions about specific schools. Yeah, no, I, I got no tip or no tips that are, are viable in my community. And I've got a lot of need and it just appears that our um, residents and schools get bypassed because there is no TIF to uh, do the upgrades within our community. Ivan, could you uh, forward us uh, through the, we can do it through the committee or to the whole automatic list, um, the information on those upcoming meetings? as well as any uh, public capital improvements that you could share with us? Yes, we absolutely can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, that's all. Thank you, Alderman Brookins. Alderman Cardenas. Uh, Chair, first of all, I want to be recorded as present for the uh, purpose of quorum. Um, and um, I, I think similarly, uh, definitely comments uh, by my colleague, Alderman Brookins, um, um, are, are, I guess, echoed by me because, you know, you, you have a lot of schools and they're not in a TIF. It's difficult for uh, capital expenditures uh, to be um, you know, to be done by, by CPS. So there should be, I think there should be a plan uh, to how to, you know, how to take care of uh, schools that don't have those, uh, 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 those extras, if you will. But uh, we're, we're getting uh, Farragut High School done uh, the next uh, year or so, and I think that's phenomenal. But I think many, many other schools are probably in the same boat and love to have uh, something from CPS that sort of uh, uh, lays it out for us the next couple of five years, which is what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. And I um, will mark you down for as present for purposes of quorum, as well as I think Alderman Napolitano. Alderman Napolitano, go ahead. See your hands up. Uh, Alderman Napolitano, did you have a question on this one as well as the? No, I apologize, Chairman. I just wanted to be recorded as present. My uh, apologies for my tardiness. That's okay. I uh, have you marked as present. Thank you. Uh, with that, Alderman Napolitano makes a motion to approve this item by the. Oh, wait, uh, excuse me. Uh, Alderwoman. Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, I think you wanted to speak on this one. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. There you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. 
Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful that we have been able to get this item to this point. Um, I am actually taking this, uh, this committee meeting from Roosevelt High School, and I am here with some of the students um, of, of Roosevelt that would like to speak on this item and explain why this is so important for this school. So I'm just going to allow them to introduce themselves and speak. Okay, hey, when, uh, when you step up there, uh, could you please introduce yourself, your name, and probably which grade you're in, I think would be helpful. Hi, I am Jenna Cruz and I am a senior. Um, I'm a captain, I'm the captain of the girls soccer team of 2022. I play on the school team throughout my four years. Uh, and soccer is a sport that brings people together and builds a lot of relationships. And having our home field would not only benefit the school, but also our community. And Roosevelt is currently an uprising school and it would help us have summer programs and it would, um, and it would help us like have our very first home game. And both of the boys and girls uh, soccer team would, very, would be very appreciative of having a field because we've struggled in finding a field and to practice in and having like team meetings and students at Roosevelt have a strong um, love for the sport and it would be great to see everyone spending time in the field and having home games thank you thanks Miss Cruz what field or what position do you play uh, I'm the goalkeeper oh okay regular hope solo well you'll have equal pay when you get to the U.S. women's national team Who's up next? Hi, um, good morning. My name is Alejandro Gomez. I am a senior in Roosevelt High School. Okay. Hi, uh, I had the privilege to play for the boys uh, Roosevelt soccer team for three years. My last, my last year playing, which was this year, we've won conference and the North and South, um, South, North and South championship. We did it without a field. We practiced on mostly mud. Um, imagine if Roosevelt had a soccer field. We would be an undefeated school in soccer. Also, soccer is such an international sport. This sport is played everywhere around the world. Roosevelt is such an international school. So I think this, I think having this field would benefit us, especially even now through the hard times that are going around in the community. Um, this will bring kids and young adults together. We can even host leagues for kids or even have pickup games. Um, when I started playing with these boys, they were just teammates. But during the seasons, these guys became my family. So what I'm trying to say here is um, playing soccer really helps build, building a family. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Mr. Gomez. What position do you play? I play defense. Left back, right back, center back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty versatile. All right. Hold on a second. All right, thank hold on you. one second. Uh, Alderman Villegas, did you have a question for him or any of the? No, no. I just wanted to, at, at, at some point, when I'm um, able to talk um, in support of this project. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have another student that is going to speak in Spanish. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Buenos días. Me llamo Eric Vega. Este, fui, fui capitán del equipo Roosevelt Soccer y es mi último año, my last year, I'm a senior. Y este, tuve la suerte de estar en esta escuela porque, porque conocí mucha gente que son de diferentes partes de, del mundo, ¿no? que son... Is the school's diverse? You no, know, we, we made a new family. You no, know, we were so kind to each other. We would, we would go to the games. We would have to travel in the CTA buses due to not having a home field, due to training in the mud and all that stuff. And you no, know, cuando conocí mucha gente, todos tienen el mismo sueño de ser profesionales en este mismo edificio de ser profesional y con esta cancha ayudaría mucho a, a nuestros futuros estudiantes 
y no solo nuestro, también nuestra gente de la comunidad de Albany Park y que quieren venir a entrenar y crear un ambiente familiar. Thank you. That was it. Thank you. Well, I've asked everybody else, which position do you play? Oh, and Pensa, Medio, Comantro. Uh, uh, I play um, defense. Mm -hmm. uh, defense. Okay. That's it. Pensa, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Chair, for, for allowing uh, these students to speak. Um, Rosebell High School is a neighborhood school, is a majority um, children of color school that has never been able to have this resource. And we are really grateful that we are going to be able to, to have this allocated for Rosebell's 100-year um, anniversary. This is an incredible gift for the school, for the community. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to see this through. Uh, thank you for having us today, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, and I'm going to have Alderman Villegas speak to it as well, if he has a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, congratulations to my colleague in the 33rd Ward. Um, here, I, I attended Roosevelt High School. Uh, I am a, a rough rider, and I can tell you that the, that the, uh, that the, um, the field conditions uh, haven't changed much as I visited the school uh, early this year uh, to talk to the vice principal and the principal about um, how the school was going. And again, just to introduce myself to the new staff since I graduated back in, in 1988. Um, so I'm glad to see that this um, project is finally coming to fruition and that the young um, boys and girls that are attending um, Roosevelt High School will now have the ability to have a world-class uh, field that they much uh, deserve. And so um, with that, I fully support this uh, project. And uh, Alderman Vegas, I'll have you make this motion to approve the item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman, and the students. Okay, uh, moving on to item number seven. This is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of turf field replacement at Salmon P. Chase Elementary School located at 2021 North Point Street in the First Ward. We're joined by Ivan Hansen from CPS for testimony on this matter. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I am the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I am also joined today by Tim Jeffries, Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement to provide the Chicago Public Schools with up to $100,000 in TIF assistance to retrofit the existing turf field at Chase Elementary School. Here is a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 2021 North Point Street in Logan Square Community Area in the First Ward. It is located within the Fullerton, Milwaukee TIF District. The school is bounded by Armitage Avenue to the south, Stave Street to the east, Francis Place to the north, and California Avenue to the west. Here is a view of the school's main entrance located on Point Street. Chase is a neighborhood elementary school serving 394 students in pre-K through eighth grade. The turf field project includes replacing the existing turf with a new surface and organic fill. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement would authorize up to $100,000 in TIF assistance, which would finance the entirety of the project. The completion of the project is scheduled for the third quarter of 2023. I thank you for consideration this request. I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. Thanks, Ivan. Uh I'm assuming that Alderman Laspada supports this um, this item, but I just had a quick question for you. And you don't have to answer right now, but maybe for the future. Um, in terms of two issues, this one is being retrofitted. What was the when was the original um, field put in? The original turf. I'll get you that information. Okay, and then when we put the new turf in, I know turf has changed over the years. The quality has changed and improved. Uh, what's the typical lifespan of some of the new turf? 
So if maintained properly, you should get um, a good 10 to 15 years out of it. But it, again, it depends on the amount of play that it does have. Yeah. Um, it, it, that has a big effect on it. Um, so we are changing um, the organic fill that goes in there from the chrome rubber on some of these fields because we do not use that, that fill anymore. Um, but I'll get you the exact data on when this was originally put in. Yeah, I know there's been some studies uh, showing that the original rubber that was used in a lot of these uh, had some potential legal issues, but um, has changed over time. So uh, looking at some of the fields, is it up to the individual school to maintain it or do we have contracts to, you know, blow out the leaves, blow out the sticks and rocks that show up on these? Is it or is it dependent on the school? It, it depends on the school and what the turf is actually used for on an elementary school. Um, this is more of a, a play surface, not a regulation, you know, um, soccer field or turf field or lacrosse field. So our, our maintenance staff custodians and whatnot would be picking it up. Um, it, it, when you get into the, you know, larger fields that high schools have or any competition fields and our sports admin um, has the equipment and the tools to maintain those fields. Okay. I know our, our one of our elementary schools, uh, we bought a, a blower and you know we've been kind of using it just uh trying to get some of the stuff off of it so i was just curious about that and then um this question injury reduction uh have we seen any data that kind of shows injury reduction on the use of turf versus our it's got to be huge at uh, versus asphalt or concrete uh or packed dirt <laughs> it's, it, well, it, you know, the injury reduction absolutely is from asphalt to turf. Um, the, the, you know, the grass, uh, black dirt um, is really just the usability piece of it. Um, you know, when we have just a large grassy area, unfortunately, when you get a lot of rain, it just doesn't become, you know, it, it becomes unusable. Or when the kids do use it, they're tracking mud, you know, back to the school. Um, but there definitely is um, some data that I can get over to the committee um, on the, uh, the, the safety of the turf versus a, a asphalt field. That's great. And uh, going back to Alderman Brooken's question, if you want to package that all together or speak to others individually, that would be that would be great just to kind of give us an overall sense of the direction that we're going with these when we can use TIP or we have to use other funds. Uh, state, I know some of the state reps have been helping out. So um, I appreciate you guys moving in that direction. I think, you know, especially listening to these kids about the quality of play, um, you know, throwing down against other soccer teams or lacrosse, whatever it might be, sounds pretty good. Um, let me go to Alderman Napolitano. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to jump in really quick and say that I, I think this is incredible what we're doing. Um, anytime that we're putting a lot of um, time and energy into keeping our kids more into athletics and into health. Uh, we're on it. We're on the right track as a city. Uh, I'd just like to also throw to uh, Mr. Hansen as well. Um, I, I've submitted uh, in 2016 and then in 2018 for um, Anahan Elementary School up in the 41st Ward, um, just for some sort of assistance or some sort of help. Uh, for this exact same, these type of projects. I'm just hoping maybe in the future, and I know this is probably not the right time, but maybe we can revisit uh, and see if we can come up with some uh, ideas or concepts because it's it's needed um, uh, dramatically. And they got a lot of athletes in the school, I think that would benefit for this. But I support this. This is awesome. Um, what, what we're doing right now is the right track um, for, for our kids. And uh, I, I, I support this. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, Alderman Napolitano makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. All right, Ivan, uh, moving on to a larger amount. This is item number eight. It is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental mental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of replacement of high pressure steam mechanical systems at Albert G. Lane Technical High School located at 2501 West Addison in the 47th Ward. Ivan Hansen will provide testimony on this item. Uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I'm the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined by Tim Jeffries, a deputy commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. 
Uh, we're going to pull up the deck here. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that would provide Chicago Public Schools with up to $10 million in TIF assistance to provide a mechanical system replacement at Lane Tech High School. The total project cost is just over $41 million, and CPS would, ref would fund the difference. Here is a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 2501 West Addison Street in North Center Community Area in the 47th Ward. It is located with the, within the Western Avenue South TIF District. The school is bounded by Roscoe Street to the south, Western Avenue to the east, Addison Street to the north, and Rockwell Street to the west. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located on Addison Street and pictures of the existing mechanical system. Lane Tech is a neighborhood high school serving 4,386 students in the 7th through 12th grades. The mechanical system project would include demolition of the existing steam boiler plant and replacement with new hot water plant and associated equipment. If approved, the intergovernment agreement would authorize up to $10 million in TIF assistance with the remaining funding coming from CPS. Next slide. Here is a photo illustrating what a new mechanical system may look like. The completion of this project is scheduled for the fourth quarter of 2023. I thank you for considerations requests. I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Are there any questions from committee members? Seeing as there's no uh, questions, Alderwoman Mitz makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Well, all those, all those aye. opposed? Thank you. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Chairman Wagesback, this is uh, yes. Chairwoman Garza. I apologize for being late, but I am here. I'll mark you down as present for purposes of quorum. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And moving on to item number nine. Uh, item number nine is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of a fire alarm system replacement and chimney stack reduction at John Marshall Metropolitan High School, located at 3250 West Adams Street in the 28th Ward. We're joined by Ivan Hansen from Chicago Public Schools who will testify on this item as well. Good morning, Chairman Wagesback and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I'm the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined today by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that provides Chicago Public Schools with just over $1 million in TIF assistance for two projects. One, replacing the existing fire alarm system and two, shortening of the chimney stack at Marshall High School. Here's a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 3250 West Adams Street in the East Garfield community area in the 28th Ward. It is located within the Midwest TIF District. The school is bounded by Jackson Boulevard to the south, Kedzie Avenue to the east, Monroe Street to the north, and Holman Avenue to the west. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located on Adams Street and the pictures of the existing chimney. Marshall is a neighborhood high school serving 228 students in the 9th through 12th grade. The fire alarm project includes replacing the existing fire alarm system, which has exceeded its useful life, and replacement parts are no longer available or made for critical repairs. The chimney reduction project includes shortening the height of the chimney stack to address the structural stability concerns. If approved, the intergovernmental agreement would authorize up to over $1 million in TIF assistance, which would finance the entirety of the project. Here's a sample from another school showing what the chimney reduction project would look like. And completion of this project is expected for the third quarter of 2023. I thank you for consideration of requests. I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ivan. Are there any questions? All right, uh, Alderman, Alderman King makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Oh, one second, one second before we take that vote. Alderman Irvin would like to speak to it. Oh, no, I it, it, go ahead. Hey, keep, keep, it, keep it moving. Okay, then uh, on that motion from Alderman King, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? 
In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. All right, Ivan, moving on to item number 10. This is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of playground and sports field construction and upgrades to the building automation system at Philip Murray Elementary Language Academy, located at 5335 South Kenwood Avenue in the fourth ward. We're joined by Ivan Hansen. He will testify on this matter. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I am the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of an intergovernmental agreement that would provide the Chicago Public Schools with what up to $1.3 million in TIF assistance for two projects at Murray Elementary School. Number one is a site improvements, including the construction of a sports field. And number two would be upgrading the building automation system. Here's a map showing the general location of the school within the city. The school is located at 5335 South Kenwood Avenue in the Hyde Park community area in the fourth ward. It's located within the 53rd Street TIF district. The school is bounded by 54th Street to the south, Dorchester Avenue to the east, 52nd Street to the north, and Kimbark Avenue to the west. Here's a view of the school's main entrance located at Kenwood Avenue and the pictures of the existing sports field and the building automation system. Murray is a neighborhood elementary school serving 484 students in the K through 8th grade. The site improvement projects include construction of a new playground and sports field. The building automation system Project includes the upgrading, repairing, and recertifying the system, which controls the environmental and mechanical systems of the building. If approved, the intergovernment agreement would authorize up to $1.3 million in TIF assistance, which would finance the entirety of the project. Completion of the projects is scheduled for the fourth quarter of 2023. I thank you for consideration this request. I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. All right. Um... Alderman King, did you wish to make any comments um, or does anyone have any questions? No, yeah, I think we can keep it moving. Just, you know, much needed improvements and favorable uh, consideration uh, would be much appreciated. Okay, then Alderman Curtis makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. All right, Ivan, still on you here. Uh, item, uh, what we're gonna do here is uh, like our last meeting, items 11 through 16 are all chimney stack reductions. Um, as such, I'll have Ivan take us through all five at once, and then we'll knock out the votes together. Um, so let's see, let me go through Item 11 through 16 are communications recommending proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter and execute IGAs with the Chicago Board of Education to provide TIF funds for eligible costs of chimney stack reductions at Philip D. Armour, John Milton Gregory Elementary School, John D. Shoup Math Science Technical Academy, ES, Simpson Academy High School, John Greenleaf Whittier Elementary, and uh, that would be it. So I'm gonna have Ivan go through those together and we'll take one vote on it. Ready, Ivan? Ready, thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Ivan Hansen. I'm the Chief Facilities Officer for Chicago Public Schools. I'm also joined today by Tim Jeffries, the Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here today to request your approval of six intergovernmental agreements that would provide the Chicago Public Schools with the $4 million in TIF assistance to reduce the chimney stacks at six schools. The schools are located within five wards and five community areas in five different TIF districts. And here's the map that shows where the schools are located. Next slide. The table includes the list of the six schools, including their addresses, the ward, the community area, and the TIF information. Here's photos of the six schools. On the next slide, you'll show the existing chimney stacks of the schools that are shown. And this chimney stack reduction projects include shortening of the height of the building's chimney stack to address the structural and stability concerns. 
If approved, the intergovernmental agreements would authorize up to $4 million in TIF assistance, which would finance the entirety of these projects. I thank you for consideration of this request. I'm available to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Ivan. And I, I misspoke a little bit. We are, we've gone, we are going to vote separately on each one, but could you put the amounts back up, that spreadsheet? Right, that one right there. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll go through and take these votes if there's no questions. And I don't see any. So item 11 is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter and execute an IGA for eligible costs of the chimney stack reduction at Philip E. Armour Elementary, located at 950 West 33rd place in the 11th Ward. Uh, Alderwoman Tabaris makes a motion to approve this item by affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Item 12 is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of chimney stack reduction at John Milton Gregory Elementary School located at 3715 West Polk Street in the 24th Ward. Uh, Alderman O'Shea makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Item 13 is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of chimney stack reduction at John D. Shoup Math Science Technical Academy, ES, located at 11140 South Bishop Street in the 34th Ward. Vice Chair Hairston makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Item 14 is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of chimney stack reduction at Simpson Academy High School for young women located at 1321 South Carolina Street in the 28th Ward. Alderman Osterman makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Item 15 is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance concerning the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Chicago Board of Education to provide tax increment financing funds for eligible costs of chimney stack reduction at John Greenlee Whittier Elementary School located at 1900 West 23rd Street in the 25th Ward. Alderwoman Sadlowski Garza makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. All right, Ivan, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate that uh, effort and whatever you can provide through the chair on the questions from Alderman Brookins. Um, I believe it was possibly Taliaferro, Napolitano, and anyone else. Uh, just please provide that through the chair or to them directly. Absolutely. Thank and thank you for your time today. You're welcome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, for item 16, uh, for those who weren't able to be at the uh, roll call at the beginning, um, I want to again uh, just comment that we are holding this item. Alderman Beal filed a Rule 41 and uh, was properly noticed. I promptly put this on the agenda for the Committee on Finance. He has now asked for it to be held because of personal issues. Um, I will hold it, but we will hear it at the next Committee on Finance meeting next month. Um, now, just as a note, um, the I don't want to say that uh, there was any issue with uh, emails or anything like that. But if you are uh, holding something, I ask that you call our committee uh, directly, the chief of staff, or reach out to me directly. 
um, as opposed to getting a letter through uh, someone else who dropped it off this morning, uh, for instance. So please um, make it very clear if you need to hold something that um, uh, we have that communication on file immediately. Um, we did have a couple of speakers, but we will hold this item until next month. Now, moving on to communications from the Department of Law, item number 17. This is a monthly report of judgments and verdicts and settlements from the Department of Law for the month of January. And this will be placed on file, or excuse me, for the month of uh, April. This will be placed on file with the clerk. Items 18 and 19 are authorizations for the payment of various small claims against the city and the denial of payment of various small claims against the city. If there's no objection, these items will be placed on the omnibus. Chairman, and Chairman, Chairman, I have uh, my hand up. Chairman Tunney, yes. I'm looking at um, the fees and settlements. Um, there's a there's a um, fee and costs here on lo Lovey and Levy. Is that something that we've already approved at the committee, the reverse, or I'm sorry, a verdict on reverse conviction for 3,175,000? Uh, if it's a verdict, it actually doesn't come to us because it's an order directly from the court, but I can have, um, the law department will be here shortly. I can ask if um, okay. they have any additional details, but that would be directly handed down by the judge. Yeah, and um, while we have them, I'm interested with the police uh, verdict on William Omar Williams for half, basically 442,000 for extended detention, malicious prosecution verdict, and and also from CDOT on a Maria De Leon with a 242,000 fall on a sidewalk. Those seem to be extraordinarily, I would just like to know more. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> so it doesn't no necessarily, yeah. I'll make sure I flag it, flag both those cases for law and they'll get right back to you. Okay, all three of them, Ian, please. The yeah, we'll, we'll share that with everyone through the chair. Okay, thank you. I know we have uh, three or four of the attorneys on, but I do not believe that they handled uh, those particular judgments and um, verdicts. So okay. uh, with that, um, Chairman, did you have any other questions on those? Good. No, I didn't. Those were the ones that just piqued my interest, unfortunately. That, no, that's, <laughs> so they are unfortunate, yes, but I'm glad we're putting them out there. Um, all right, let me move to the supplemental agenda, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have two proposed orders authorizing Corporation Council to enter into and execute settlement orders in the following two cases. This would be 1A and 1B. Uh, the first one is Daniel Taylor versus City of Chicago in the amount of $14,250,000. 1B is Bernilda Torres as independent administrator of the estate of Jose Angel Felipe Nieves, um, deceased versus City of Chicago in the amount of $1.898 million. Uh, with us today, as, um, as usual, uh, we have Jessica Felker and Caroline Franzak. And I think we will begin with 1A, and that would be Corporation Council Felker. Hello, good morning, committee. Thank you for having me today. Thank um, you. Yes, I. My name is Jessica Felker. I am the Deputy Corporation Counsel for the Federal Civil Rights Litigation Division. Uh, I am presenting Daniel Taylor versus the City of Chicago at all. It's a federal case before Judge Lee. Mr. Taylor brought this lawsuit alleging that he was wrongfully convicted in 1995 of the 1992 fatal shooting of Jeffrey Lassiter and Sharon Hogabook that occurred in Uptown. We recommend settling this case for 14.25 million. This settlement is a cost-effective measure to limit the city's exposure. Mr. Taylor, along with four others, was convicted of a double murder of this double murder, excuse me, after he and his co-defendants confessed. Mr. Taylor's conviction, along with those of his of his three co excuse me along with those of three of his co-defendants was overturned in 2013. Mr. Taylor had spent 21 years in prison. 
he and his three co-defendants received certificates of innocence. Mr. Taylor claims that he was wrongfully convicted because his confession and the statements of others used against him were false and coerced and that exculpatory evidence was withheld. Mr. Taylor uh, will present evidence of an alibi. The shooting occurred around 8.45 p.m. Mr. Taylor was arrested in an unrelated disorderly conduct charge at approximately 6.45 p.m. He was taken to the 23rd District CPD lockup, and those lockup records will show that he was in lockup until 10 p.m. Two defendant officers testified that they saw him near the scene at 9.30 p.m. Mr. Taylor concedes that he saw those officers, but claims it was at 10.30 p.m. The three other individuals who also had their convictions overturned, his co-defendants, Paul Phillips, Lewis Gardner, and Dan Patrick, also sued the city and their suits have already been resolved. Mr. Phillips and Mr. Gardner were in custody for 14 years and they settled their suits for 5.25 million each. The city went to trial against Dion Patrick, who spent approximately 21 years in custody, just like Mr. Taylor, and the city lost that case. Mr. Patrick was awarded $13.3 million in compensatory damages and 90,000 in punitive damages. The city appealed that judgment, lost, and it ended up resolving the entire case, including fees and interest for 17 million. Settling Mr. Taylor's suit for 14.25 million is a cost-effective measure. If we go to trial, Mr. Taylor will likely ask for 21 to $42 million in damages from the jury. His counsel will also likely petition for $4 million or more in fees. Given this, a settlement of $14.25 million is a reasonable amount and will avoid the potential exposure. Uh, to address Alderman Tunney's uh, question about the um, Anderson case, I believe, where Lovey and Lovey was paid $3.125 million, we went to trial, uh, those for fees, excuse me, we went to trial in that case and lost. The verdict was $7.55 million. As a result, we were liable for attorney's fees. But that amount shows you um, how much we could be liable for in the Daniel Taylor case. And it's an example of how expensive these cases are to litigate. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Falker. Uh, Corporation Council can take any questions on this one, and we'll start out with Alderman Spazzato. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, hey, Jessica, I, I didn't ask you one question the other day because I, I don't understand these uh, co coercion cases. So he says he was coerced. So obviously that happened when he was in jail. He says, yeah, I did it. I did it to, to stop him from doing whatever. Now, at what point did he say, no, I really didn't do it. They, they coerced me, they, they <clears throat> tortured me, they, whatever they did. At what point in the process did he say, no, I really didn't do this? He did that at his criminal trial. He presented he presented evidence that he didn't do it, and he said he didn't do it at his criminal trial. So okay, so so, so not after. until they went to trial, and it's probably about the only time you can say it. Then I would guess, correct? Right. That was oh, publicly. I, you know, I don't know what he told his counsel beforehand. But right. Yes. Okay. So it, so during the trial, and then he had a jury trial, but yet even though all of this evidence uh against them that we, you gave us that he was locked up to 10 o'clock they still the jury of 12 convicted him. correct and i would say correct you on the fact that all of the evidence was that he has today was presented there is more evidence today and part of his claim is that that evidence was withheld from him okay all right thank you jessica thank you thank chairman you. thank you do we have any other questions for Ms. felker all right, then Alderman Urban, Alderman Urban. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quick question. Um, this, uh, the amount in the settlement, is this something that was reached or uh, by, by the court or through the magistrate, or is this something that was, was it a forced conversation or was it an open conversation? Well, often in these cases, uh, we begin the conversations uh, and then 
we decide to go to a magistrate to complete them. And in this case, we actually went to the district court judge. But so both happens. We, we can talk before and then go to the judge to, to make the ultimate resolution. And we decided to do this uh, on the front end. Oh, we, I don't know if what you mean by on the front end. Uh, we were scheduled to go to trial and we engaged in uh, settlement discussions prior to that. And then the parties agreed as those were continuing to go before the district court judge to final to to hopefully come to a resolution, which we did. And this is inclusive of fees or um, or does or is a fee conversation separate here? No, this is inclusive of fees. This is all all we would pay is a total of 14.25. And what if we paid outside counsel on this case uh, to defend us? Uh, to date, we have approximately paid uh, 2.15 million. And why didn't we settle this case earlier before spending $2.1 million on a case that somebody's got a certificate of innocence on. Um, that would reveal work product and attorney client privilege. I'm, I'm happy to discuss that with you offline. Okay. Um, that's a little baffling um, that, that we would spend that type of money uh, with someone with a certificate of innocence. Did that occur before or after the lawsuit started? Um, I believe he filed his complaint after that certificate of innocence was issued. If not, it was closely thereafter that he received the certificate of innocence. He filed his case in 2014 and he got the certificate of innocence in 2014 as well. Does that, could you understand why I'm asking what I'm asking? I understand um, your, uh, your question. As I, I said, it, we need to have the conversation offline about strategies. Can I, um, Alderman, if, if you don't mind, could I jump in for a second? Is, uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but the process for obtaining that certificate of innocence, um, can you explain that? Was that, have any yes. bearing on what that, not just the process, but what that obtaining that certificate actually means? It's yeah, not so, so uh, if I can back up, uh, one thing I will say is uh, a person can be wrongfully convicted without the police have con having um, committed misconduct. Those are two different things. And the claims against him are claims against the officers in the city are about misconduct, uh, not whether uh, the plaintiff is innocent or not. But yes, the certificate of innocence are completely separate uh, proceeding and it happens in state court and the city and the officers are not invited or allowed to participate. Often it, and it's a specific process for obtaining uh, a, a obtaining a certificate so they can go to the court of claims in state court. In that process often, and it is, um, it, there is no opposition, um, not always. Sometimes there's opposition from the state's attorney, um, but often there's no opposition. It's not an adversarial process. The person submits a petition that is not, um, that, that is not, a, tested by the adversarial process. There's no other side. And then, um, and so the difference here is that the, when the city gets involved in a lawsuit, they have the opportunity to investigate and to determine uh, what the evidence shows. Um, so I know that, it, that it, we had in Mr. Patrick's case, the issue was whether the certificate of innocence was even uh, allowed to be evidenced in the case. And it was on appeal ruled that it could be evidence, um, but it's 
value was very limited, the court said, because it was not subject to an adversarial process. Um, thank you, Alderman. Sorry to interrupt. I should have asked for point of information there, but um, did, does that answer your question, or at least uh, until she can speak to you offline? I'm good. Okay. All right then. Uh, seeing no other hands raised, no other questions. Alderman Urban makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Is anyone aye. opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Felford. All right, ladies and gentlemen, moving on to uh, Department of Law items. This is item 1D. Uh, Brunil de Torres, independent administrator of the estate of Jose Angel Felipe Nieves, deceased versus the city of Chicago in the amount of $1.898 million. We have Deputy Corporation Counsel Caroline Franzak from Department of Law uh, will speak to this item. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Caroline Franzak. I'm a Deputy Corporation Counsel in the Federal Civil Rights Litigation Division. And I'm here to seek authorization to settle the case of Brunel de Torres as independent administrator of the estate of Jose Nieves, deceased, versus City of Chicago and City of Chicago Police Officer Lowell Hauser. It's presently pending in the U.S. District Court of the Northern District of Illinois under Judge Kennelly. Uh, we are seeking the amount of $1.898 million. The case arises from a January 20. January 2nd, 2017, fatal shooting of 38-year-old Jose Nieves by off-duty Chicago police officer Lowell Hauser. In December of 2019, Lowell Hauser was convicted of second-degree murder in a bench trial in which he did not testify. The court found that he had an actual but unreasonable belief that he was threatened with deadly force, and therefore his use of deadly force in response was unjustified. On behalf of Nieves' estate, his mother, Brunilda Torres, brings this lawsuit against Hauser under Section 1983 for excessive force and under Illinois law for wrongful death and survival actions, and against the city of Chicago under 1983 for Monell policy plans of excessive force, state-created danger, and under Illinois law for respondeat superior and indemnification. To limit the city's potential financial exposure the law department recommends settling this case for $1,898,000 from the city of Chicago with Low Hauser contributing $2,000 out of his own pocket. The facts of the shooting are as follows. Nieves and Hauser were acquainted before the January 2nd, 2017 shooting. The incident occurred outside 2525 North Lowell, which is in the city of Chicago's 31st ward. It's a two-story residential building with four apartments. The building was owned by Almidia Rivera, whose daughter, Diana Diaz, occupied one apartment, often with her boyfriend, Hauser. Another apartment was rented to Rivera's granddaughter and Diaz's daughter, Melissa Fournier. In 2015, Melissa allowed Jose Nieves to move in with her, but Rivera evicted Melissa in 2016 after learning Melissa had been collecting rent from Jose Nieves, but not transmitting it to Rivera. Rivera then allowed Jose Nieves to rent the apartment directly from her. Diana Diaz and her son blamed Melissa's eviction on Jose Nieves and allegedly began harassing him. On December 11th of 2016, which was approximately three weeks before the shooting incident, Hauser saw Nieves and Rosado arguing in the building stairwell and told both to return to their apartments. Nieves called 911 and reported that an unknown black male off-duty Chicago police officer who lived in the building had pulled a gun on him. But by the time Chicago police patrol officers responded to the building, Nieves and Rosado had resolved their dispute and the officers left. Nieves was dissatisfied with the response and again called 911 requesting a supervisor. A sergeant responded to the scene, spoke with Mr. Nieves and initiated a complaint register. However, none of the responding officers' reports reflect any attempt to identify the off-duty black male officer that we now know was Lowell Hauser, who Nieves said threatened him with a gun, and even though witnesses later told IPRA that police spoke to Hauser on December 11th. 
Three weeks later, on January 2nd of 2017, around 9.15 a.m., Hauser shot and killed Navez in front of the residence. Hauser then called 911, identified himself as a police officer, and stated that he had to shoot someone who tried to attack him. Hauser told a responding detective that when attempting to drive away from his curbside parking spot, Nieves had stood in front of his car and blocked his path. Hauser stated uh, that he identified himself to Nieves as a, as a Chicago police officer, and Nieves responded by threatening to shoot him and burn his car. Hauser claimed Nieves then reached into his back waistband area, and fearing that he was going to be shot, Hauser exited his car and fired three shots at Nieves. One of the two bullets struck Nevez, entered his back, and proved to be fatal, and he was pronounced deceased at 9.51 a.m. shortly after arriving at the hospital. Detectives initially investigated the incident as an aggravated assault to a police officer. April was on scene to investigate the officer-involved shooting. No weapon was found on or near Nevis's body. And on about January 9, 2017, Area North detectives suspended their investigation pending IPRA's investigation. IPRA then referred the matter to the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, and on January 18, 2017, Hauser was charged with first-degree murder. We recommend settlement for the following reasons. First, Hauser's criminal conviction will likely prevent him from denying that he unreasonably used deadly force. The city will not have the same problem denying the, the use of deadly force, but as a practical matter, Hauser's conviction will prevent the city from contending that the use of force was justified. While the city has argued and will continue to argue that Hauser was acting outside the scope of his employment, there is evidence that he did act in a complete police capacity on that day. First, Hauser told the investigating detective that he identified himself to Nieves as a police officer in response to Nieves using gang slogans and yelling at him. Second, Chicago Police Department's initial reports and investigation treated the incident as an aggravated assault on a police officer and Chicago police spokespeople told the media that Hauser had acted in a police capacity, although the statement was later softened to have, may have acted. Third, while we do not yet know Hauser's position because he has so far asserted the Fifth Amendment, there are reasons to believe he will claim he was acting as a police officer, such as to seek indemnification for any compensatory damage award. In addition, he also filed a grievance with the Fraternal Order of Police when the law department denied representation in the civil case because it determined that he was outside the scope of his employment. Finally, three weeks after the fatal shooting, Nieves called, or I'm sorry, three weeks before the fatal shooting, Nieves had called 911 following an argument with Hauser and reported that a black male off-duty police officer threatened him with a gun. However, none of the reports from the three responding police officers mentioned Hauser or that the officers had even tried to identify the officer. Further, IPRA's post-shooting interviews of people who were present at 2525 North Lowell on December 11, 2016, revealed that the unknown black male officer was Hauser, who was carrying his gun during the incident and was seen speaking with the responding officers outside of the apartment. The Monell evidence is also damaging for the case the December incident is very damaging on plaintiff's code of silence and state created danger claims. Plaintiff will argue that had Hauser been identified in IPRA or BIA done their jobs, Hauser would have been suspended or criminally charged and unable to carry his gun on January 2nd of 2017. Further, Hauser's criminal or Hauser's employment record suggests he should have been fired prior to 2017. His complaint history reflects 26 CRs, of which 10 were sustained, two for domestic violence, and several CRs reflect allegations of aggressive, confrontational, or violent behavior. Further, Hauser had been enrolled three times and should have been enrolled a fourth time in the Chicago Police Department's early intervention programs for behavioral issues. Furthermore, on three separate occasions, Hauser was referred for fitness for duty examinations in which the psychologist determined that he was not mentally fit to perform his duties. Finally, we must consider the fees and costs associated with the litigation of this case. The city's outside counsel has billed about $900,000 to date over the five years of litigation and projects over a million more through discovery, summary judgment, and trial. Plaintiff's counsel further claims over $1 million in fees so far, and they estimate over $1 million of additional fees through trial. In April of 2017, the plaintiff initially demanded $12 million, and recently we were able to come to an agreement to settle the case uh, by the city of Chicago in the total amount of 
$898,000, the law department recommends the proposed settlement as an appropriate means of limiting the city's financial exposure on this case. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Corporation Council. Um, let's see. Alderman Lopez. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman. Just for purposes of quorum, if I could be added, please. Thank you. Better than ever. That's you are on. Can you hear me okay? Or are you? Uh, I'm all good. It? Thank you. Okay. Um, Alderman Brookins. Hey, was there an offer of judgment ever made? Um, yes, there was. Uh, back in uh, February of 2020, an offer of judgment of $500,000 plus reasonable fees and costs was made, which the plaintiff rejected. Was that a tactical reason as to why that was so low? Um, I believe the offer of judgments are capped per ordinance at $500,000. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Alderman Brookins. Anyone else? Questions? All right, then Alderman Brooken makes a motion to approve this item by the affirmative vote of all members present for the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Corporation Council for uh, outlining these cases for us. Uh, seeing that we have no other business on our agenda, Alderman Mandel makes a motion to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hopefully nobody wants to stick around. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone, and have a Thank great you. rest of the day.